Uh, I think everybody's pretty much finished except me. I want to introduce the man that I know most of you came. You didn't come to see me. You came to see this man. But Thomas Mesro is now in a firm with Susan Yu. He's still a practicing attorney. I want to tell you a little bit. About a year ago, in fact, almost exactly a year ago, last night, he was speaking to the Los Angeles County Bar Association, I think was the name of the group. When I got the tape that they did, I looked at it, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, why are they keeping him to the end? Why are they keeping him to the end? They kept Thomas Mesero waiting to the end. This is the Los Angeles County Bar Association. But when I saw the tape, I understood. Those people mostly still thought Michael was guilty. This was last year, in 2010. So when people say, you know, who would you recommend as a lawyer? I'd say, well, only if you're facing the death penalty, I'd call Susan and you and Tom Mesero, or maybe Michael Men in Texas. But I know very few attorneys that I would recommend. And I know hundreds of them. Very few would I recommend. And this man is a straight shooter. He, you know, if, if you're guilty, he's not going to try to make you look like a saint. But if you're innocent, like Michael was, he'll go, he'll go the full hundred-yard dash to make that touchdown for you. He's an incredible man. Thomas Miserell really probably needs no introduction. <laughs> First of all, thanks so much for, uh, for coming, and thank you uh, for the, the kind invitation, uh, William, to speak. You know, I don't care if an organization is large or small or rich or poor. If it stands for the right principles, I'm with it. That's right. And anyone who is devoting any time out of their busy life to promote the reality that Michael Jackson was completely innocent of these horrific charges and that Michael Jackson was one of the kindest, nicest, most sensitive, most giving people on the planet. I'm with you. I'm behind you. Okay? And that's what I believe this group is doing. You know, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. It's my profession. I really love my profession. I have a great belief that we, as criminal defense lawyers, have done more to promote freedom in this country than almost any other group I can think of. And we're often attacked, we're often vilified, we're often ridiculed. We fight very, very stiff odds most of the time. But we make people prove their cases, we protect our freedoms, and we make sure, as best we can, that innocent people go free. And I will tell you in no uncertain terms, Michael Jackson was 100% innocent of these right. horrible charges. He really was. <laughs> now, when I get into a case, um, I try to keep my objectivity. I don't necessarily believe the client or anyone else. I don't believe the prosecutors, I don't believe the police, but I don't necessarily believe the client till I find out for myself what the evidence is, who the client is, who the witnesses in the case are, for and against, and I start to gradually form my own conclusions about what I'm gonna do. So when I first met Michael Jackson, uh, I was in Florida, not far from Orlando, his brother Randy had called me. I'd known him for many years. We used to socialize once in a while. I'd never represented anyone in the Jackson family. And he called me and he said, uh, we don't like the lawyers we have. And my brother, you know, has always been interested in meeting you. And we spoke to like Johnny Cochran, who thinks you're the one to defend him, which was very nice of Johnny. I'll always be indebted to him. Yes. Um, and I flew down and I met Michael. And he was very quiet, very shy, he said very little. Randy did most of the talking. I was being questioned uh, in front of Michael by Randy and others so that Michael could make a decision as to whether or not I was the one he wanted to represent him. And I told everything I was asked about my background, my upbringing, my education, my career, uh, the kinds of cases I had tried. And I left Orlando not knowing whether I'd ever hear from him again. And about three weeks later, Randy called and said uh, they wanted me to be his defense attorney. And I said to Randy, I assume uh, you've been talking to a lot of other people. He said, no. He said, when Michael heard you, he said he wanted you, which was just a very great surprise to me. But nevertheless, one thing led to another, and I became his defense attorney. It was a great honor and a great privilege, but it was also a great challenge. 
because as I think everyone here knows, the media was 100% against them all over the world. Yeah. They were just absolutely having a field day trying to torture this poor soul who was bewildered and terrified, a creative genius, a sensitive humanitarian, not someone built for a criminal courtroom, let's face it. And this was a long, painful ordeal. This trial lasted almost five months. We were there five days a week. So for five days a week, all day, Michael had to sit there listening to people say that he was a Mafia Don type who had organized a criminal conspiracy to falsely imprison a family, to abduct children and, and to commit criminal extortion, that he was a child molester of the most malicious type who took a cancer-ridden child, plied him with alcohol that could have poisoned the child to soften him up for the crime of child molestation, that he had organized other people to help him commit these kinds of crimes, that he had intentionally and maliciously and manipulatively given alcohol to underage children for his own selfish purposes. I mean, these charges were bad, okay? These charges were horrific. You know, Americans uh, are fascinated by homicide cases, and I defend homicide cases. But American people are more repelled by child molestation charges than they are by murder charges. This is the worst kind of thing you can try and pin on any human being. And I guess what I have to tell you is that I occupied a chapter in Michael's life that was very, very dark and very, very evil <coughs> in terms of what he had to go through, uh, what people were trying to do to him in order to profit themselves. I've never seen a media onslaught in any criminal case this bad. I really have. I don't know if any of you remember the week the jury was deliberating. All of the cable stations were showing jail cells on TV every day where he was supposed to end up. The intent was to condition yeah. the jury and hopefully influence them to convict. That's right. I've never seen it in any case. If any of you have ever seen jail cells on TV every day on every major cable station while a jury is deliberating a case, tell me where it was, because I never had. Okay, never had. And the documentaries on television leading up to that trial, um, the reports on uh, who the witnesses were supposed to be, the reports on the 1993 case uh, were absolutely scandalous and disturbing and horrific. And they were designed to do one thing and one thing only, convict. Why? Not for justice, for ratings and revenue. Because the ratings and the revenue were in a conviction. One very prominent person in the music industry told me after the trial, you cost the music industry billions of dollars when you acquitted them. Because they were looking forward to having him arrested right away, taken to jail. There'd be a month or two buildup to the sentencing, which would be the biggest sentencing in the history of the world, sentencing Michael Jackson to probably 20 years in state prison. He would have been not dressed the way he normally dressed. He wouldn't have had his makeup on. He would have been living in a jail cell in isolation for months. During those months, there would, they would have been reporting on information from the jail. Is he going to commit suicide? What is he eating? What is he reading? Who is visiting him? This was going to be a ratings bonanza if Michael Jackson were convicted. And they wanted a ratings bonanza. They were not there for justice. They were there for ratings, revenue, and big business. So they tried to spin what was good for their business. They didn't care whether it was just or not. And their goal was to report whatever they felt would help them achieve their objective they only just needed one thing more. They needed a jury verdict of guilty. And that's what they tried their best to create. Now, William said something I think he believes that, that I don't totally agree with. Uh, he thinks Mr. Snedden brought the case not caring whether he could win or not, and I don't believe that. I think Mr. Snedden and his cohorts thought they could win, and I think they convinced themselves they had a good case. And I think the media and the prosecution reinforced one other's, each other's beliefs that there was going to be a conviction in the case. They all had separate but similar interests in a conviction. There's something in this country that likes to see people go way up and then come down and splatter. It makes for good, 
TV. It makes for good shows. It makes for revenue. Everybody in the media wants shock value these days, reality shows. One show on a gory homicide case after another. But seeing Michael Jackson sent to prison was going to be one of the most dramatic events in world history. They thought. They thought. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get into a case like that, you have forces coming at you from every angle. You have the media trying to attack you. You have other lawyers trying to get into the case, going around your back to family members, trying to get to Michael, trying to maneuver you out because they want to be in the case. You've got to be careful of witnesses because they're all trying to profit somehow. Not all of them. Some of them are very honorable, but some of them are not. And some of them want to find a way to make a splash with the media, publish a book, get television interviews, whatever. And this was the most media-saturated trial in the history of America. You had over 2,200 accredited media, which is more media than covered the O.J. Simpson and the Scott Peterson cases combined. So you're kind of trying to navigate through this sea of distractions and focus on what it takes to win. But fortunately, we have a jury system and while it's not perfect, because people are never perfect, and while mistakes are made, because people make mistakes, I think the jurors generally try to do their best to follow their oath, look at the evidence carefully, follow the judge's jury instructions, and do what's fair and correct. I think American juries try to do that. They don't always succeed at it, but they try. Mm -hmm. And the media is not as powerful in the end as they think they are. Amen. They said O.J. Simpson would be convicted, he was acquitted. They said Robert Blake would be convicted, he was acquitted. Mm -hmm. They said Michael Jackson would be convicted, he was acquitted. They recently said Casey Anthony in Florida would be convicted, she was acquitted. So I truly believe that when someone is picked to be on a jury, they change. They take an oath to follow the law, they know what they're being asked to do, that a life is in their hands, that they can destroy or not, or destroy the people around that life or not. And I think they carefully watch for six to eight hours every day who those witnesses are and what they say, and what happens in their eyes, what happens in their demeanor, what do they feel about them. This is not living on sound bites like most people do. They turn on the tube, they get a few reports, and they think, oh, I know the case. This is not life by soundbite on a jury. This is a very serious, exhausting, serious thing. And I had never tried a case in Santa Barbara County, and I certainly had never tried a case in northern Santa Barbara County. And before I got to the start of the trial, I did spend some time in various bars and restaurants alone in my jeans and leather jacket, just hanging around, hoping somebody would want to talk, and someone always did, to find out how the community felt about Michael Jackson. Because in the media, you got the impression this was a conservative, stiff, cruel, harsh community that was ready to lynch him in five seconds. That's the way the media portrayed it. And I was attacked by jealous, lawyers, by jealous people around the Jacksons when I didn't make a, a, a motion for change of venue. Because I got the feeling, hanging out in that community, that we'd get a fair trial. Hmm. I got the feeling, yes, people were very conservative in many ways. Yes, people were very law and order minded, for sure. But yes, people also didn't want government going too far into their backyards. I got the feeling there was a very libertarian spirit among many people in this community and a strong independent spirit. That's what I determined myself by simply hanging out in some bars and restaurants. I never saw an African American person. The people who talked to me were mostly white and Latino. And I know that the Jackson family and many people and advisors around the Jacksons were very concerned that there would be no African-Americans on the jury, and I was not, because Michael Jackson brought races together. He didn't divide them. 